My name is uh, Dr. Christopher Dusing, and I am the owner and director of Integrative DBT and Psychotherapy, a group practice out of uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the United States. And today I'm really excited because uh, our senior intern, uh, Denise, is going to present her term paper on artificial intelligence and the human brain. Uh, this has been in the works for over two months, so I've been uh, really excited to see what comes of uh, the paper, and I know that a lot of work has been put into it. Uh, so this is an opportunity that we present to some of our interns to present their work, and then uh, we open up the floor for discussion and input. So I'll turn it over to you. Denise, go for it. Thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Deusing. I'm just going to share my screen really quickly. Okay, awesome. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. This truly means a lot for me. For all of you joining in on my first ever virtual event, I can't wait to dive into our topic today about whether or not we as a society will ever be able to implement the concept of a mind into artificial intelligence. Um, just a little bit about myself before we begin. I'm currently a third year undergraduate student majoring in psychology and minoring in cognitive science. And I am a research assistant at a cognitive development lab at my university in which I create stimuli for the experiments and studies we conduct on preschool age children, um, which um, is definitely my interest. I'm really interested in cognitive development and I'm working towards getting my PsyD after graduation and becoming a pediatric psychologist one day. Um, as a guide about the schedule of the presentation, please feel free to ask questions along the way. If something doesn't make sense, like please stop me. This is open space. I want everyone to feel comfortable. And for our agenda, um, we'll be starting with Defining, defining what a mind is, diving into a little bit of philosophy, and then for parts two and three, I'll be laying down some foundation work, and the last bit will be some discussion. So let's get started. To tackle the debate about whether or not we can implement a mind into artificial intelligence, I want to clearly identify what a mind is first and dive into a little bit of philosophy. So in simple terms, the mind is a complex entity that engages in information processing. Um, to this day, there's still an ongoing debate about whether the mind follows the dualistic perspective or the monism perspective. And this is also referred to as the mind-body problem in cognitive science. Um, during the ancient Greek period, Aristotle proposed that the mind and body were one substance, and Aristotle compared the mind to a lump of clay. And the clay can be transformed into any new form. It can start off as a cluster or like a ball, but with manipulation of the material, you can create something incredibly vast, like a sculpture or a vase. And Aristotle believed that the mind and body were one like this clay. The potential of different forms and shapes are our thoughts, while the actual material of the dirt and minerals are physical brains. And this concept is known as monism. On the other hand, we have dualism. This is where the mind and body are two separate entities. And Greek philosopher Plato proposed that the mind and brain exist, but in different realms. Plato explains that the metaphysical world was equated to our mind, where the mind is not something that can necessarily take shape, like atoms, cells, and units. However, the brain is composed of material where it can take shape, like neurons, synapses, and chemical reactions. One realm, the mind, exists in a non-comprehensible substance, while the other, the brain, exists in a tangible substance. For example, the concept of a circle. The mental aspect of a circle defines a circle being a round plane whose boundary consists of points that are perfectly equidistant from a fixed point that could be infinitely split into equal parts. Yet the physical aspect of this perfect circle doesn't exist in our tangible world. Every physical circle in our world is not a perfect circle. 
because we will never be able to infinitely split it into exact equidistant portions. It's just not possible. Um, before I keep going, I would love to hear from you guys what your beliefs are about whether the mind follows this dualistic or monistic perspective. Would anyone want to share? Well, I could start it off. I think it's more of... I'd say a dualistic perspective. I do think they're two different entities. Um, the way I think of it, I think about like the brain being like the physical portion. And then our mind is kind of like this mist around our brain or like this fog. And that's not quite like tangible. However, I, f I do feel like the space in between like the mist and the actual organ of the brain there is some sort of like connection there that we haven't been able to figure out yet. And I think that is my understanding of like what the mind can be. Any other thoughts from anyone in the room? Can I talk? Is it okay? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think I also believe in the dualism because when I start thinking about the mind, like there really is no biology behind it. So you know, the mind is probably in like the separate realm that you were mentioning. Yeah, I definitely agree. Well, thank you for your input. Um, I do think it's interesting to hear your reasoning about why the mind is two different entities. But I'm fortunately, I'm going to have to add on to this mind body problem and only complicating it <laughs> a little bit. So some believe that because our minds are made up of physical matter or a physical substance that we can measure and understand, this leads to the conclusion that therefore our mind is also depicted in these terms, which means that the mind would also have to be measured in these measurements or specific units. However, if this is true, what would the substance of the mind be and how would we be able to measure it? So that's some food for thought about people who do believe that our brains are, our mind is a physical matter. But on the flip side, some people believe that the mind is not a substance and it can't be physically measured or equated to physicality due to things like our desires, our needs, beliefs, and thoughts that can't be tangible, let alone use those physicality measurements to understand a consciousness. Most people who believe that the mind is not a physical property compare it to something similar to a soul or an entity. Thus, with this mindset, the brain is just the conduit to what the mind wants to portray. Regardless of what you believe and this forever ongoing debate, there is still information processing occurring within our minds. Information processing has three parts, the input, the processing, and the output. This process was created by mathematician Claude Shannon, and the way the information processing works is similar to the way a computer works. The mind manipulates mental representations and performs cognitive tasks like attention, memory, language processing, perception, decision making, etc. I actually got this picture from one of my professors in my cognitive science course, but I think of the parts of the computer correlate to our brains. So let's start with the keyboard. This is our perception and our sensations. Um, whatever the environmental stimuli we are receiving, we're also interpreting at the same time. So the actual head of the computer is our thought processing. And just like the inside hardware of the head of the computer, this is where the processing occurs which in comparison, our body is our thinking process. Whatever was typed or searched through the keyboard goes to the processing portion and processing portion of the computer and whatever we are sensing goes to our brains and we start interpreting and thinking about what we just experienced. So during this process, simultaneously, there's stored information. Just like a computer saves your search history and remembers the code functions you're putting into a program, we're also storing the information we just experienced if it is important. 
So for example, as you touch a hot stove, your sensations are the nerves in your fingers feeling the heat. And the perception you make is that this stove is emitting heat and burning your nerves. Then your processing component is registering that this is damaging your hand and causing you pain. At the same time, you are storing this experience as valuable information, which will hopefully teach you that stoves are hot. Lastly is the output. This is our behavior from everything that happened in this one experience being depicted. This can be the printer of the computer printing a sheet or the image that is displayed at the end of the search engine. In regards to our behavior in the stove example, this action is us like moving our hand away from the stove. And this is Claude Shannon's three-step theory of information processing. So the last component we're going to be discussing before we move on to types of learning is the level of analysis model. The levels of analysis model was created by David Marr, who is a British neuroscientist and a computational theorist. And the three parts of the levels of analysis model are the computational level, the algorithmic level, and the implementation level. And that is the order that's in. So the order matters in this case scenario. So this model is our framework for understanding our mind's information processing system. The first part is the computational level. At this level, we are focusing on what our general goal is for a desired outcome and activity. So here we are thinking about what our goal is and what our outcome will be, that's it. There's nothing, in, nothing else is gonna be here, just our goal. So an example can be making an omelet. The computational level of making an omelet is to cook and have a finished product. Our desired activity is to have an omelet for us to eat at breakfast, that's it. The next level is the algorithmic level. This is the actual nitty gritty details of what our individual steps and directions are for our goal. It is what the name sounds like. What is the algorithm that we would be taking to complete our task? This is where we're asking ourselves what steps we are going to be taking to accomplish our goal. However, we're not physically doing anything yet. We're just mentally preparing and thinking about each detail about what we have to do. So what operations are we going to end up performing? And in our omelet example, our algorithmic level can consist of gathering ingredients, cracking the egg on the buttered preheated pan, throwing the eggshell in the trash, adding a teaspoon of salt, pepper, et cetera, et cetera. But remember, we're not physically doing these steps yet. The last step is the implementation level. This is where we take physical action. What are the physical systems we are doing to accomplish this task? What steps are we doing to execute our goal? This is where we physically crack the egg and add the salt and all the little list of details we thought about in our algorithmic level, we're actually going to be implementing into the implementation level. I also wanted to talk a little bit about mental representation and how we elicit this within ourselves. So before I dissect into mental representation further, I wanna explain how it works in the first place. So the first step is to have a referent. This is the thing in the external world that our representation will stand for. In our example, we can use the conch shell. The next step is intentionality. This is where the mental content has a relationship to the real world event. The next step is content. This is where the representation has content or in other words, it stands for something. So for our conch shell, although we found a conch shell, we know it's not the only type of shell in the world. We know it's just a representation of what a shell is or what a shell can be. And lastly, we have a bearer, that's us. This is where the bearer actually realizes the representation. As you can see, this is not a hard concept to understand. We use mental representation all the time, all day long, every single day, and we'll be using it for the rest of our lives. But I just wanted to break it down to make it a little bit more simplistic. So like a pattern to everything else, there are three main types of mental representation. There's imagistic, propositional, and symbolic. When we think about mental representation, the most popular or common type of mental representation is imagistic. 
Energistic representation is just what you think it sounds like, similar to our conch shell example. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the actual object to what you're seeing, and this term terminology is called isomorphism. I'd like to mention that not everyone follows or uses the same type of representation. There's actually a characteristic some people may have in which they do not have visual or this imagistic mental representation, and this is called aphantasia. I learned about this study, um, it was called the Bainbridge study in class, where um, there's two types of candidates and one group of candidates have regular mental representation or imagistic mental representation, while the other group of candidates have aphantasia. And each group is shown a picture of a room with objects in the room for a certain amount of time, like maybe a minute. Then each group is asked to draw as many objects as they could remember from the picture they previously looked at. And the results were that the aphantastic group drew fewer objects with less color. However, they had higher spatial accuracy and fewer errors compared to the control group. I find this interesting because you would think it would be the opposite. You would think it's more difficult to draw out a picture of a room with the objects without having imagistic mental representation. But what's actually more interesting is the, con the control group's results um, they actually had less spatial, aware spatial awareness and often included false items that were never in the picture in the first place, which is so cool to think about. Um, so the next type of representation is propositional. This is a structure-like representation where the truth value can be true or false and specify some way the world can be. An example of this can be the statement, quote, the United States are made up of 50 states in total, and they are divided up by five regions, the Northeast, the Southwest, West, Southeast, and Midwest, end quote. This would be a propositional mental representation. The last type of representation is symbolic. What this means is that a symbol stands for an idea or an object that does not have a genuine resemblance to that idea. So for example, a symbolic representation can be the question mark. We know that the curvy line with the dot at the bottom represents doubt or uncertainty about something, even though it doesn't look like anything else we've seen before. Mental representations are important because they allow us to picture objects in situations and reason about abstract ideas, plan out and carry appropriate actions, communicate with others, and engage in forms of social cooperations. All of these assets are essentially the building blocks of our mind. Now, moving on to the um, types of learning, there are three types of learning for computers. There is unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Unsupervised learning is a type of machine learning where our model learns from unorganized or unlabeled data, meaning the input data is not paired with corresponding output categories or labels. So during the process of unsupervised learning, the machine explores the structure of the input data on its own, the way that it's exposed to it. So the machine has to learn how to identify patterns, groups, clusters, within the data it has without any human, human guidance or prior coding embedded into the machine. So for this example, we have a chaotic group of shapes that include um, yellow squares, red triangles, and blue circles. So this is the raw input data. Once the computer has been exposed to the input, it is now interpreting what it sees. Remember, during this interpretation step, the machine does not have a known output yet, doesn't know how to organize it quite yet. Um, it's only viewing it, viewing it what it has been exposed to. The next step is the algorithmic step. And the machine or our model, um, let's see, has to come up with an efficient algorithm of how to organize the input data. It, all, it is also important to remember that the model has no training data. I can't emphasize this enough. There's absolutely no training data involved in this. And by what I mean about training data, 
is an input data set that is used to train the machine or computer to find certain patterns. In unsupervised learning, there's no training data dating used for, a machine, for this machine to give us a certain output. After the algorithmic level, the model is processing what the data with the algorithm it chose on its own to give us an output. In this case scenario, our machine organized the chaotic data into shape and color, and the model organized the red triangles, the blue circles, and yellow squares. This is unsupervised learning. Um, the next type of learning is supervised learning. This type of learning is exactly what it sounds like. The model learns from input data and pairs it with the corresponding output based on the desired outcome from a human being. Again, the computer is given raw data of the shapes and it looks like we have red triangles, purple circles, and yellow squares in this case. Unlike unsupervised learning, there is traded dating in this type of learning and there is a desired output implemented into the algorithm by the human being. The model then goes to process this algorithm and gives us the output of a pyramid, sphere, and cube. This is different from unsupervised learning because the training and desired output wanted the raw data to be organized in three-dimensional structures instead of general shape and color. And the last type of reinforce is type of learning is reinforcement learning. Unlike supervised learning, where a model learns from our labeled desired, labeled or desired data, and unsupervised learning where the model finds patterns in unlabeled, undesired data. Reinforcement learning relies from the feedback based on the actions taken, in it, taken from its environment. And I'm going to show you a short video from OpenAI, the same company that made ChatGPT, where you can see reinforcement learning in action. And then I'll break down each step of the reinforcement learning depicted in the video. So let me put that. On Earth, the simple rules of natural selection and competition led to the evolution of increasingly intelligent life forms. Today, we ask if comparably simple rules and multi-agent competition can also lead to intelligent behavior in a new virtual world. These agents are playing hide and seek. These agents have just begun learning, but they've already learned to chase and run away. This is a hard world for a hider who has only learned to flee. However, after training in millions of rounds of hide and seek, the hiders find a solution. The hiders learn to use rudimentary tools to their advantage by grabbing and locking these blocks they can create their own shelter. The seekers are locked in place for a brief period at the start of the game, giving hiders a chance to prepare. Even so, the hiders must learn to collaborate, accomplishing tasks that would be impossible for any single individual. The hiders are not the only ones who can learn to use tools. After many generations of failing to break into the shelter, the seekers learn to jump over obstacles using ramps. However, after many millions of rounds of having their shelter breached, the hiders learn to take away the primary tool the seekers have at their disposal. Note that we did not explicitly incentivize any of these behaviors. As each team learns a new skill, it implicitly changes the challenges the other team faces, creating a new pressure to adapt. We've also put these agents into a more open-ended environment, randomizing the objects, team sizes, and walls. In this world, they learn to construct their own shelter from scratch, requiring that they arrange multiple objects into precise structures. To prevent seekers from using the ramps, the hiders move them to the edge of the play area and lock them in place. We originally believed this would be the final strategy that the agents learn. However, we found that after more training, the seekers discover that they can jump on top of boxes and surf them to the hider's shelter. In the last stage of emergent strategy that we observed, the hiders learn to lock as many boxes as they can before constructing their fort in order to defend against box surfing. So how do agents acquire these skills? They're trained using reinforcement learning, an algorithm inspired by the way animals on Earth learn. The agents play thousands of rounds of hide and seek in parallel for many days. They train against each other as well as past versions of themselves using an algorithm called self-play. Co-evolution and competition on Earth led to the only generally intelligent species known today, humans. While this world is far less complex than Earth, we have found evidence that simple rules can lead to increasingly intelligent behavior from multi-agent interaction. 
We hope that with a much larger and more diverse environment, truly complex and intelligent agents will one day emerge. So in this case, the raw input data would be the game arena and the agents. And the agents are only pre-programmed to either hide or seek. And based on the environment, the agents either experience success slash failure or reward slash punishment. If the seekers were able to find the hiders, they would learn and remember the best course of action to always seek based on the environment. Once the obstacles were introduced, there was no training data implemented or programmed into our agents. So the agents used their resources of their environment to either hide successfully or seek successfully. And based on that, they were either rewarded by not being found or punished by being found and vice versa. Um, of course, this entire process takes hundreds and thousands of trials, um, but that's what reinforcement learning looks like. On Earth, the simple rules of natural selection and and I made a little chart to just put everything together, kind of see it in one image of unsupervised learning, supervised and reinforcement. So the learning goal for unsupervised learning, again, is to find hidden patterns in unlabeled raw data. Supervised, it's to learn mapping from input to output based on labeled data. And reinforcement is to learn to make decisions for peak efficiency. And the task types are um, clusters and disorganized data for unsupervised learning, pattern recognition for supervised, and decision making for reinforcement. And some examples for each category is the clustering, image classification, like matching input to output, and reinforcement is pretty much like games, like this open AI game. And we'll also be discussing AlphaGo in a little bit which is probably my favorite modern day example. So moving on to the Turing test, um, the last thing I'd like to discuss before we dive into modern day examples is the Turing machine and the Turing test. So the Turing test stems from the Turing machine that was created by Alan Turing, a British mathematician in 1936. And the Turing machine looks like this. It has um, components of an infinite like ticker tape, a sensor, a sensor head to read and write on the tape, and an alphabet of symbols and set of instructions. So the tape of the Turing test operates on like an infinitely long tape divided into discrete cells. Each cell can contain a letter or a symbol that the sensor head can read and write on to execute through a set of instructions. Um, the Turing machine starts in an initial state with the symbols written on the tape. And at each step, the machine reads the symbol with the sensor head. And depending on what the instructions are and what the symbols correlate to, the sensor head is either going to move left or right and perform an action. So as you can see on the chart on the right hand side, if the symbol says one, the sensor will look at the symbol with the first cell that says one. And then it will look at the print component, which says E, meaning erase. Sometimes it'll say erase or write. And then it'll move to the right or left, depending on the set of instructions, and then continue to follow what the next line is. Um, the Turing machine will follow these instructions. The picture I have is like incredibly short. It's never this short. Um, but the goal of this picture was for it to get like all zeros at the end of the tape. Um, usually it's much more longer depending on what type of task the, you know, experimenter wants the Turing machine to complete. So why is the Turing machine important? Well, the impact it had, it formalized algorithms and essentially is the basis of all modern computing and coding in a way. This Turing machine led to the Church Turing thesis, which was named after Alan Turing on the left and Alonzo Church, who was an American mathematician on the right. And Church believed that no computational procedure will be considered as an algorithm unless it can be represented as a Turing machine. 
and Turing vouched that a function is effectively calculable if its values can be found by some purely mechanical process, meaning the Turing machine is a symbols processor that can compute anything theoretically. But if this is true, does this mean that everything a human mind can do, a Turing machine can do? Which brings me to our topic about what the Turing test is and how it works. So I want you to imagine you're sitting in a cubicle and you're given a computer. Your objective is to communicate through this computer based on the conversation you're engaging in. And you have to identify if you feel like you're talking to an actual human being or if you're talking to a robot. The computer can only pass this Turing test if it successfully fools you into thinking they were a human being through the conversation you had with it. And this is known as the Turing test. So now that we covered what the mind is, philosophy of the mind, mental representation, types of learning, and the Turing test, we're finally going to explore some modern day examples of artificial intelligence. First, I wanna bring up AlphaGo Zero. So AlphaGo is an artificial intelligence program that is based on the ancient complex board game of Go. And to play Go, it requires two players, a square grid board and black and white stones and a bowl for captured stones. And the objective of the game is to control more territory on the board than your opponent by strategically placing stones surrounding empty areas. The reason AlphaGo has blown up is because it was the first artificial intelligence that defeated the ultimate Go 18-time eight, champion, Lee Seedall. Lee Seedall won one out of five games against AlphaGo in March of 2016. To, to me, this is a little bit sad. He was so devastated that he stated there was no point in playing Go anymore since there is now a machine that could defeat anyone, which is pretty sad if you think about it. And he actually retired after playing with AlphaGo competitively at least. I think examples of artificial intelligence evolving in ways like this really does like take the human element of most com concepts in our lives. And sometimes it can ruin the gift of what human beings are capable of doing. So this is one example. Another example I wanted to talk about was AI generated art. This is a huge debate right now. Um, there are two cases I wanted to bring up. The first case I wanted to share was in September of 2022, the Colorado State Fair's annual art competition. So a contestant used Midjourney, which is an AI program that turns lines of text into hyper-realistic graphics. And this image is actually the submission that the contestant uploaded. And this actually ended up winning the competition, which still has people debating on the ethics of this competition. The contestant did say that he was not going to apologize for his piece and stated that there were no rules being broken when he admitted his piece. Um, personally, I think it's a little bit muddy. I feel like if you're competing in an art competition, everyone kind of has the intention of you doing the work or even if it's digital art, you still have to like move your own hand and use your own technical skills. Like on, like for my example, I draw on my iPad and I still have to know how to draw to use my iPad. So that's still considered digital art. But I didn't think that now we'd have to think about putting rules as you can't use AI in an art competition. I think it's kind of like given um, I'd love to hear everyone else's opinion on whether or not you think he did nothing wrong or if you disagree with his um, opinion on whether or not he deserves to have won. So would anyone want to share their opinions about this Colorado art competition? Well, yeah, uh, I just have a question. Do you know what type of judges were they? Like, I, I assume these judges weren't robots, right? No, they weren't robots. They were people. So I feel like they should have taken that into consideration when voting for the winner, you know. So I think, yeah. like, the judges are to blame as well, not just the, you know, artist or submissioner. 
I definitely agree. And I'm not entirely sure if he was like, if he had stated like, oh, this is AI art. I think he just like submitted it. So I think maybe even the judges were like oblivious to whether or not this was created through artificial intelligence. But I definitely agree with you. The judges should be also kind of held accountable for who gets to win. Anyone else want to share their opinions before I move on to the next modern day example? Yeah, I'd like to speak on it. I think the whole idea of AI generated art is really complicated and I think it can be useful for some like uh like building layouts or like trying to visualize like projects in that sense, but I feel like when it comes into terms where it's like overplaying like human experience like there are so many talented artists out there and this is kind of taking away from the fact that so many people put in so much hard work towards like artwork. I know I'm so jealous of people who have these artistic abilities and I think it kind of takes away from these natural born abilities that people have. Yeah, I definitely agree with you, Kayla. Like I know even in Dr. Deucing's clinical shadows that we partake in, like AI art is something that's concerning to a lot of people. Like they are worried about losing their jobs or worried about, you know, not having a steady income because their employer says, oh, you know, we could just use AI. We don't have to pay you anymore for this type of service. So it's definitely something that can cause a lot of trouble. Um, but I'm going to move on to our next uh, modern day example if, before anybody wants to share. There's a couple of things in the chat, I believe. Oh, let's see. Oh, we have Chloe saying, I agree. And I think that there has to be more discernment when looking at art, specifically AI art. And um, although AI prompt generation is considered a somewhat learned skill, it should be a tool rather than a replacement. I think that that oftentimes is, is what comes up in dialogue is, uh, is this going to be a replacement or kind of an adjunctive tool that, that humans are going to use? It's interesting, though, to think uh, about the gentleman who, who kind of got replaced, the Go expert, uh, in terms of the best Go expert in the world. That saddens me a little bit because when I think of the carnage that's going to happen, and I, I think that there is going to be a lot of carnage with AI, and I'm not attributing good or bad to it. I'm just going to say there's collateral damage. I think of it almost as um like lower wage workers or uh, possible like replaceable jobs. I didn't really think of it in terms of like, well, a chess master or a Go, uh, like the most brilliant Go person in the world can be replaced by AI. So that really flipped it on its head for me, uh, Denise. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you. I think you said it perfectly. Like, it's definitely going to cause some collateral damage, whether we want it to or not, in both good and bad ways. And Blake says, eventually it will be so saturated, there won't be any way to distinguish AI from human created. Yeah, that's true. I definitely agree with that too. Just a little bit scary and intimidating to think about. Um, okay. So it does beg the question, like the judges, right? There there's, has to be awareness on the judges part. Also though, where is the responsibility of the individual who's using the AI to, um, help with that discernment right uh classic classic thing is in terms of now in academic circles it's a, it's a catch like it's a catch and run game in terms of who's using ai to write papers who's using it as a tool who's using it to cut and paste and the lines becoming increasingly blurry so the ethics behind it gets very very uh, murky on both ends definitely i definitely agree so our last modern day example is the art piece, um, Can't Help Myself by Yuan and Peng Yu in the Gegenheim Museum. I actually am gonna play like a little bit of the video. We don't have to watch the full thing of how the piece works. So I'm gonna play that right now. <laughs>
So the way that this art piece works is pretty much the machine is created faulty on purpose, where it starts off clean and it's filled with oil to keep it running. And the robot must keep sweeping back the oil towards like whatever entrance valve it has to keep functioning. However, the tank or whatever holds this oil was built with the intention of a leak. So no matter how many times the robot sweeps the oil, it will forever leak. Hence the name of the art piece, Can't Help Myself. I actually think this is a cool art piece because it's not something we traditionally see, like a painting or a sculpture. Um, for some reason, I also feel a little bit more comfortable with the ethics of this piece since its purpose was not to like win a competition or outdo an actual human being's work. It's just a different way of kind of showing what AI is capable of. Um, what do you guys think about this um, can't help myself piece? Is it using uh like the the reinforcement learning that you were talking about earlier? Or well, that's a good question. Because yeah. it seems like the whatever AI or computer is running the oil rig, it seems to be analyzing its environment in some way, maybe through a a camera or something, or maybe the artist programmed it to do that. I'm not too sure. Yeah, I think it could definitely be considered as like reinforcement learning. I looked into like the website, didn't really like say anything about like how it was, what type of learning it was using. But I think you're on to something for sure, because it constantly has to look at the environment, whether or not how much oil is left over, if it has to push back, like you saw it went back to different sides to see which side had more oil or it was leaking more on one side than the other so i think you're definitely on to something about that well i feel like if if we just related it back to that uh the hide and seek video wouldn't it learn a better way to sweep the oil like i don't know in like a circular motion or something i mean i think it could also be a combination of like supervised learning like maybe oh. it's only programmed to go like a certain way to make it look helpless because yeah. that's the point i think of the piece to make it look so helpless helpless so it's definitely using like those like maybe a sensor like you mentioned and maybe it's only programmed to do a certain amount of task um because it can't be fully efficient then there'd be like i guess no meaning behind the art piece it'd just be like a happy robot this robot has to be sad <laughs> but those are my modern day examples um, it's a, it's a and, really interesting example because when I first looked at it, I didn't have a context of what it was. I actually thought that was blood that it was uh, sweeping up. And so then it goes pretty deep for me in terms of, wow, the machine is sweeping up blood. It's its own blood because oil is a, a machine's blood if it's a if it's a machine in motion like this. And so it became very symbolic in a way. I was like, oh, the machine is kind of sweeping up its blood, but it's leaking out and it's dying. And all we can do is watch. Right. <laughs> exactly. I felt a little bit um, kind of helpless in a way. And I also kind of felt bad for it. Yeah, it's funny how like you can feel bad for something that's not even like alive just by, you know, making it faulty. And Chloe says, I love this piece and think it functioned as a great critique of relationship between humans, work culture and machine, among other things. We empathize with this robot because it keeps trying to do, um, keeps trying to help itself, but cannot and avoid its inevitable death. And yeah, all we can do is watch. Um yeah, and Joan, you're right. The funny part is it doesn't even feel anything, and yet we all feel pretty bad for it. Yeah, but that was my presentation. Um, it's The floor is open for discussion if you guys have any questions or comments, concerns, um, before I give my concluding piece. Yeah, floor is open. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, uh, 
I'd encourage people too, if you can, come on camera and uh, then we can close out and uh, celebrate this wonderful uh, presentation. It has me thinking. I'm still really sad for the Go player. I'm going to have to work on that with me my too. therapist. <laughs> I'm, I'm sad for him too. Yeah. Imagine being like a national 18 time champion. You just like never play again. Well, that's one of the things I think that kind of gets lost in the conversation in terms of, okay, AI, it's going to replace jobs and it's going to replace. I think that we can get really dehumanized in terms of thinking, well, you know, people will just find other jobs or people will find when uh, I feel like it, it doesn't really work like that. People are going to be grieving and mourning, have loss of identity. Older populations uh, may be forced to try and embrace technologies that they didn't grow up with. Uh, so there's all these really complex questions uh, that come up. And so I'm, I'm curious to hear what other people think. And Denise, you, you you can take down the um the artwork so that we can spread out the the tiles as well. Hey, Kayla. Hi. Um, I think the whole idea of AI itself can be a very useful supplement in certain areas, like kind of like how I talked about earlier with like the whole like art piece and like how AI can be used for like building models and architecture and stuff like that. But I think when it comes down to it, hu like one of the biggest things I think between like that I think I, str I struggle with using AI is like human experience like humans have things that they have gone through and they have feelings and AI doesn't or artificial technology and technology in general you can't really replace feelings and I feel like that passion and that feelings really like plays through in like human work and I think that's where I kind of struggle with it I'm not saying that AI should be completely done away with I think it is useful and helpful but it's also not necessarily reliable all the time, you know, like, how do you know how accurate it is? Like with like ChatGPT, like ChatGPT, I think is only up until like 2022 is like the most recent like year that it's able to like find information from. So I just think we should be very cautious about the ways in which we are using AI going forward and very cognizant of the ways in which we're going to like implement it. Yeah, I definitely agree with you, Kayla. Like, although it's such a, like, efficient tool that can definitely, like, save time and make your, like, life easier, like, we also have to kind of be careful about how it can easily get out of control and honestly ruin lives. Like Dr. Dusing said, like, some people are going to be mourning about their jobs if they do lose their jobs and are replaced by these AI computers, so... Mm -hmm. Um, I see a chat. Somebody said a little sad all around, but it's still exciting. That's true. I was also thinking well, like I even just from a, oh, please, no, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, I just want to say, Dennis, you did an amazing job with the presentation and the research work. Uh, this topic was really interesting. And I just want to say, I don't think AI could ever replace the human brain. Because AI is nothing without humans. I've noticed that in the types of learning uh, section, there are three, I think, the unsupervised, supervised, and uh, reinforced training. I mean, learning, sorry. And all these types of learning have one thing in common, that is input of data. Who inputs the data? Humans. So I think, uh, I, I don't think AI could ever replace the human brain especially in the field of psychology. Thank was, you so much. Yeah, I definitely I agree with the you. Same thing. But do you think that like whatever AI can take another output as its input? So like, you know, it takes the first, let's just say supervised uh, learning model, right? And then it takes that output into its own unsupervised learning model. So then it just does whatever it wants without any human assistance even though obviously the human helped it in the beginning with the first supervised learning data but after that it could kind of just do whatever it wants does that make sense yeah that makes sense and that's very scary to think about because then what else is evolved by itself yeah. yeah how is it going to evolve by itself because like for the open ai example um they learned how to pick up those objects. They weren't pre-programmed to have that function. Like, oh, you can move these things around. Like they had to kind of figure that out on themselves, which is incredible, but also 
I feel like the best word can be like dangerous potentially. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was just a simple task of hide and seek. You can probably give it an even scarier task if, you know, whatever you can imagine. Yeah, definitely. So, well, um, I, oh, okay. no, I, I just wanted to I, also, too, I just I'm not I don't want to present just the carnage side of AI. I see it as an incredible possibility. Uh, for example, I just saw a recent um, uh, excerpt on NBC News about AI providing uh, CBT, CBT-based therapy or CBT-based interventions. Uh, so I think it has the ability to possibly uh, be an adjunct uh, to actual human therapists in terms of providing some of these manualized treatments. I have questions though, in terms of how is AI going to learn how to hold silence or feel the room, right? In terms of what's right. going on in the therapy room. But uh, in reading group last week, and I'll just close out with this, um, Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, well, it's kind of blurry. Uh, he almost, I think, is prophetic here uh, in terms of talking about an existential vacuum. So this is before computers. This is before anything like this. But um, he states, uh, the existential vacuum, which is a place of extreme vulnerability, like a lack of meaning and purpose in life, uh, manifests itself mainly in a state of boredom. Uh, now we can understand Schopenhauer when he said that mankind was apparently doomed to vacillate eternally between two extremes of distress and boredom. Uh, in actual fact, boredom is now causing and certainly bringing to psychiatrists more problems to solve than distress. Here we go. And these problems are growing increasingly crucial for progressive automation will probably lead to an enormous increase in the leisure hours available to the average worker. The pity of it is that many of these will not know what to do with all their newly acquired free time. So uh, that quote from uh, Frankel, which is on page 107 in the fourth edition of Man's Search for Meaning, I think really begs the question, okay, AI is going to open up a lot of things. It's going to open up a lot of time. And what are we as human beings going to do with that? Are we going to continue to kind of participate in an endless scroll? of things, or perhaps just uh, feeding ourselves to the algorithms of distraction, or are we actually going to use that time and energy in constructive ways to both, uh, I guess, evolve as human beings and also help technology evolve in a way that's adaptable with us uh, versus kind of um, uh, destructive. So I think it's all about constructive versus destructive. So whether the Terminators are coming, I don't know. Maybe they'll come and maybe they'll help us out and have some leisure time. We can save the earth. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to say um, what an incredible presentation. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you, Kayla, too, for the presentation that you did uh, on your hysteria paper and the yellow wallpaper. And um, as a whole, the cohort um, this spring has just been such a wonderful one. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for uh, the things that you have taught me. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really worked hard on this and. Um, I'm so glad I got to share like my passion for AI a little bit. Um, Chloe says AI has personality. This may be an interesting read. Okay, I'll definitely check that out. And of course, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Great job, Denise. Thank you. Great job.